Hello, and thank you for joining us today for Forward's production of The Flying Lovers of Vitebsk by Daniel Jameson. I'm Marcella Kearns, Artistic Associate at Forward, and I'll be your guide to the play and the production today. Flying Lovers is a sensory, emotional treat that, like the artist Marc Chagall's own work, finds multiple ways to capture a moment in time on stage. This play is not unlike other plays in Ford's history, such as 44 or 46, which blend and bend theatrical genres. Today, I'll share with you the story of how the play came to Ford, thoughts from our director and designers, context for the time and places, and a little bit more about the lesser known art of Bella Chagall, Mark's wife, first wife, and great love. About the play and production history. Flying Lovers was first produced by Knee High and the Bristol Old Vic and premiered at the Bristol Old Vic in 2016, and it's been making its way through the international theater scene since. The play enjoyed a multiple location tour in 2018, including in the United States, uh, and also including a performance at the Spoleto Festival, and has most recently had a production at Quantum Theater in Pittsburgh in November. Forward's production is the Wisconsin premiere of the piece. Emma Rice, the director of the 2018 production which toured, was part of the original inception of the piece. She and playwright Daniel Jameson had actually been a couple when the play premiered, featuring them as the Chagalls in an earlier form. Written over 25 years ago, she said the play was called Birthday, made by two people very much in love about two people very much in love. I remember vividly the passion we felt for the piece. It was the 1990s and we were fascinated by Eastern Europe. We had both visited Poland, we had heard firsthand stories of communism and martial law, and it had the privilege of witnessing a fearless and ferocious kind of theater making that made British theater look like feeble by comparison. We resolved to change the world and set about becoming master and mistress of our own fate. On a visit to Paris, we saw Marc Chagall's double portrait with a glass of wine in the Centre Pompidou. It loomed over us with a mysterious joy, toasting the possibilities of life. Dan wrote me a poem. She looks like you, it said. And with those words, it all began. It felt as if through time and form, one couple looked another in the eye. Mark and Bella challenged us to be artists. And looking back, I believe they provoked our creative birthday, she said. We slipped our happy young feet into the shoes of these incredible people and started to imagine a life far more complex and threatened than our own. Returning to this show in 2016, many things had changed. Married no more, Daniel and I were able to revisit Mark and Bella older, kinder, and wiser. This time we slipped our middle-aged feet into shoes more delicate and perhaps a little more uncomfortable. Now the couple from the painting in Paris challenged us to look round corners and dig more deeply into the politics of their lives, personal and historical. They demonstrated and demanded that we show a life not only filled with hope, love and invention, but also one filled with fear, homelessness and personal compromise. About Daniel Jameson. He is originally from Southeast London and attended Exeter University to study drama. He worked for Exeter-based Theatre Alibi as an actor, joint artistic director between 1995 and 2000, and writer. In 2015, in fact, he won an Action for Children's Arts Award for his writing for children with the company. He has many plays under his belt, one of which, of course, we know uh, in, one, in a certain form, both Birthday and in, as Flying Lovers and more. He's also adapted novels by Charles Dickens, Graham Greene, and Dick Kingsmith for theater. Among his body of work, he's also written for BBC Radio 4. Flying Lovers has been on Forward's radar for a few years. 
During the pandemic, advisory company member Mike Fisher saw a streaming version of the play overseas and recommended it. Our literary committee, which is charged with looking for plays that we might want to include in our season, was able to read the script in 2021 and it determined to acquire the music for it so that our advisory company of artists, part of whose job it is to uh, is to approve the slate that Jen Gray proposes as an upcoming season, um, they wanted to review it. They did end up reviewing it at the same time as what the Constitution means to me in October 2022. Both plays ended up in the latter half of our 15th season. Artistic director Jen Uphoff Gray's reasoning in pairing them up was as follows. Constitution, on one hand, is a very intellectual, monologue and dialogue-driven piece, and she was looking to balance it with something that's not overtly intellectual, but that satisfied another part of the audience's appetite. Flying lovers fit the bill, especially as Madison has Brian Cowing, a gifted director with this kind of movement-driven, music-laden, imagery-rich play. Including the play in the season was first about whether we could get the rights, of course, and second, whether Brian was able to direct it. Flying Lovers stylistically sits in the realm of other productions that Ford has done that push the edges on the kind of work we do without shifting the identity of the company. Ultimately, Jen says, some of us may be transported now by something more lyrical, not to mention the incredible creative opportunities afforded and available to designers on the project. To Brian Cowing, as busy as he is, not only directing, but also right now serving as the interim artistic director of uh, Children's Theater of Madison, he generously made some time with me to share with us his passion for flying lovers. I asked him, first of all, what inspires you as an artist about the piece? His reply, I think the thing that drew me to the piece is its uniqueness. It's not really a straight play, not really a musical. It's its own form almost. There's a huge part of the show that scared me in terms of the unknown. When you sit down and read what the publisher gave us, it's about 45 minutes of text. The rest is all music and movement that make it a 90 minute piece. Creating that much story through non-text-based storytelling is something that I get excited by. We get little hints in some of the music or a little piece of stage direction, but a lot of it is open to interpretation. I also asked Brian, because he has an incredible eye for stage picture and choreography, to tell us something about his process. His answer to that, he quoted Mark Chagall. I adore theater and I am a painter. I think the two are made for a marriage of love. I will give all my soul to prove this once more. He said he loved it. And he grew up just loving theater and loving classic movie musicals. Taking dance, Brian says, from a young age, you start to notice patterns and shapes in motion. So theater or dance really actually becomes a painting. He explains, with choreography, you always have to be clear with what's the story you're telling first. If you don't know, there's no reason for dancing. Dancing always comes from something. When we can't speak anymore, we sing. When we can't sing, we dance. Going into rehearsals, I usually have multiple plans for how things could go. And working with movers of all different levels is something I love. Uh, You never know how something is going to look on an actor's body until you try, so it's good to have options and to be a collaborator with your actors. So I try to set up some storytelling anchors, and I might not know exactly how we're getting from anchor A to B, but at least we all know the story. Then it's really about building the transition and connecting all the dots to make it polished. Stage pictures require every aspect of design to work. And he says, it's really an amazing thing when everything comes together like you imagine it in your mind. What the play is about. 
Without giving away particulars of how Mark and Bella move through the story, both playwright Daniel Jameson and our director Brian Cowing have specific thoughts about the threads that comprise Flying Lovers. I want to put those two together now for you. From Jameson, first of all, he says the Chagall story is, quote, remarkable because it's so interwoven with 20th century history. Mark was in Paris before the First World War when modernism was at its height and cubism was just taking off. He briefly returned to Russia to marry Bella and got trapped there by the war, narrowly avoiding conscription into the Tsar's army. They were then swept up in the Russian Revolution, and when they did finally make it back to Western Europe, they got caught up in the beginnings of the Holocaust. They just escaped from France to America by the skin of their teeth in 1941. But there is a contemporary resonance to the flying lovers of Vitebsk as well, because it deals with the trauma of the refugee experience. In exile, Mark and Bella watched in horror as the Jewish homeland of their youth was systematically destroyed, and the Nazis set about murdering the entire Jewish population of Europe. There is a strong sense of their homesickness for a home that no longer exists. Jameson also mentions very specifically that the theme of exile gives the show an international flavor. This is something that you'll be able to see in the music of the piece, which is sometimes in Yiddish, sometimes in Russian, sometimes in French. Uh, Jameson says it's really a celebration of the texture of different languages. In this way, the show invites an enjoyment of moving between cultures as if laying down rugs between houses for a party. Perhaps we don't always need to understand each other's every word, he says, to enjoy each other's company. Brian echoes and amplifies the playwright's and Rice's early thoughts. Brian says the play is, at its core, a love story. At first rehearsal, he opened his remarks with the reminder that the Chagall story is sometimes called the greatest love story in art history. Another major theme that Brian plums in the script is art versus family, the constant push and pull between making art and what it actually costs to pursue it. There are other works of art that feature a talented partner who gets overlooked. Sondheim's Sunday in the Park with George is one example, or even the recent film Maestro he brought up. Now, Bella Chagall was a wonderfully talented writer in her own right, and that's a more obscure part of their story. Displacement is another major subject of the Flying Lovers of Vitebsk. The Chagalls frequently had to pick up their lives and move. The toll that it takes and the grief of what's left behind is really palpable in this piece. And finally, the play immerses us in the joyous experience of making art. Color, light, music, all design elements and flying lovers really contribute to that feast of the senses that approximates the ecstasy of creation and the sumptuous feast of slow looking at a canvas. I'd like to share some historical and artistic context at this point. First, there will be some resources at the Playhouse for you. For both Bella and Mark in their respective practices, their artistic practices, their Jewish identity was really very uh, inspiring and informative. You'll find some context for their history and the story both in your programs and in our lobby display on the hallway into the Playhouse. In your programs, there's a biographical timeline of Mark and Bella's life together. In the lobby, there are several images of Chagall paintings, which Jameson included in our version of the script as a reference to folks working on productions. You'll see directly how these paintings inspired moments in the production, from stage pictures to shifts in lighting. I also recommend that you take a few minutes with the panel excerpting some of Bella's writing. The passage that we've chosen to highlight from a collection called Burning Lights sets out her purpose in building her memoirs. Now, originally written in Yiddish in 1939, her work was published posthumously and included illustrations by Mark. So you'll see also some examples of his companion illustrations to her words. If you are a digital patron, 
One beautifully organized resource for Chagall's paintings online is markchagall.net. You can surf through many of his paintings, but feel free also to drop us a line at Ford if you're curious about which paintings to compare with your viewing of the performance. We're very happy to share more information with you and to chat with you uh, about our experience of the piece in person. More historical context. As Jameson related, Mark and Bella's story is told with an historical backdrop that really spans two world wars and the Russian Revolution. Specifically, in 1917, swift moving social and political turnover led to an eventual takeover by government of government by Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin. From food riots in February to the abdication of Tsar Nicholas II, from multiple reorganizations of government through the press of worker Soviets, the Chagalls really were witness to the rise of the USSR. Very early on, Chagall was appointed as the Fine Arts Commission Commissioner for the Vitebsk region. Uh, this was in 1918. A New York Times article about this period and about an exhibition of uh, Russian work from the area really frames it succinctly. The Russian Revolution of 1917 had an enormous effect on Chagall. Now, this is important. The passage of a law abolishing all discrimination on the basis of religion or nationality gave him, as a Jewish artist, full Russian citizenship for the first time. This inspired a series of monumental masterpieces such as Double Portrait with Wine Glass in 1917, celebrating the happiness of the newly married Chagall and his wife Bella. As the months went by, the article continues, Chagall felt the need to help young residents of Vitebsk lacking in artistic education and to support other Jews from humble backgrounds. Once he was named commissioner for the arts in his city, his first task was to organize festivities marking the first anniversary of the October Revolution. After the celebrations, Chagall devoted himself to creating his school, which was inaugurated on January 28, 1919, with the goal of providing a high level of teaching in all art styles. Now, the People's Art School was indeed revolutionary, but Mark didn't last long there. More to come in the play, but the basics here. Uh, the curator of the Centre Pompidou asserted that in a little town in today's Belarus, far away from Moscow and St. Petersburg, the history of art was written. Between 1919 and 1922, the vanguard of the Russian avant-garde, including artists Kazimir Malevich and El Lizitsky, taught alongside Chagall at his invitation and explored a new leftist art best expressed through suprematism. Suprematism was a movement indeed based in the supremacy of pure artistic feeling rather than realistic depiction. The school afforded access to art education as it was open to all, cost nothing, and held no age restriction. Chagall and Malevich didn't see eye to eye, however, and eventually Chagall departed with Bella for Moscow and work in the theater and eventually made their way west. They made their way west very far from the place where they had both come from, Vitebsk. Uh, as I said, Vitebsk now is in modern-day Belarus. At the time, it enjoyed traffic as a hub of trade, given its proximity to river and a railroad. By 1897, the Jewish residents of the city numbered over 34,000 and comprised about 52% of the city's population. Some of them had uh, come from Moscow after expulsion in 1891. Bella Rosenfeld's family, wealthy and invested in the life of the town, was part of the Hasidic community there. Um, dialing forward many years in time, unfortunately, a Nazi campaign in July 1941 led to the destruction of Vitebsk as a retreating Russian started a fire that raised the city to the ground. 16,000 Jewish residents who hadn't fled already ended up in a ghetto. And by October 1941, liquidation of the population had begun. In an open letter to the city, published in a New York paper in 1944, after Mark and Bella had safely settled in the United States, Mark wrote, 
I did not live with you, but I did not have one single painting that did not breathe your spirit and reflection. Uh, now, was this about Vitebsk? Was it about Bella? There is quite a significant overlap. To Bella. One of the tensions between Mark and Bella and their perspective on art is never sharper than when Mark says in the play, for you, there is always something more important, and that is why you'll never be a writer. And yet the historical Mark attested in an afterward to a second publication of Bella's work that her last words on earth were, my notebooks. Bella, uh, born in Vitebsk, was the youngest of eight children. She studied at the University of Moscow, in fact, under Stanislavski for a time. Uh, interested in both theater and art, she also wrote for a newspaper before her life was altered with her marriage to Chagall. They had one daughter, Ida, and Bella was a ferocious advocate for both Ida and Mark's well-being. Though the focus of her life was family, she made time to compose autobiographical accounts whose detail and imagery are as evocative, imaginative, and personal as Mark's paintings. She wrote memoirs in Yiddish of her childhood in Vitebsk, capturing the essence of her family's life and the celebration of the year's cycle of holidays in burning lights. Another round of recollections, published as First Encounter, paints the picture of their meeting, her first meeting with Mark and her early days with him. You'll hear her own perspective in the play, her insightful observation, her own rich connection to image. Her work, however, as I mentioned earlier, wasn't published until after her death when Mark made it his task to illustrate her recollections. I'd like now uh, to honor Bella by sharing an excerpt from First Encounter. This is from the chapter, The Birthday, in which she writes about how she had figured out early on in their acquaintance uh, and they're falling in love with each other, um, when Mark's birthday was. So in this chapter, she gathers up presents to take to him and goes to where he lives. Here from First Encounter. That summer, you had a room of your own, remember? I knocked on your shutter. You often kept it at half shut even during the day. Was it to soften the light or so that you couldn't be seen from the street? You let me in yourself so that your landlady wouldn't see me. I came so often, and today I had all those parcels. I stood and waited for you to open the door. It wasn't easy to manipulate the bar. What is all this? You hustled me in and stared. Have you been away? Do you think people only have parcels when they've just got off the train? Guess what day it is. Ask me another. I never know what day it is. No, I don't mean what day of the week. Today's your birthday. Your jaw dropped. You couldn't have been more astonished if I'd said that Tsar had just arrived in town. How did you know? I undid my scarves and draped them over the table and over the walls. I spread my colored quilt over your bed, and you suddenly went and rummaged among your canvases and put one on the easel. Don't move, you said. Stay just like that. I was still holding the flowers. I wanted to put them in water before they died, but I soon forgot all about them. You dashed at the canvas with such energy it shook on the easel. You plunged the brushes into the paint so fast that red and blue, black and white flew through the air. They swept me with them. I suddenly felt as if I were taking off you too were poised on one leg as if the little room could no longer contain you. You soared up to the ceiling. Your head turned down to mine and turned mine up to you, brushing against my ear and whispering something. I listened as your deep, soft voice sang to me. A song echoed in your eyes. 
Then together we floated up above the room with all its finery and flew through the window and a cloud and a patch of blue sky called to us. The brightly hung walls whirled around us. We flew over fields of flowers, shuttered houses, roofs, yards, churches. What do you think of it? Suddenly you had come down to earth again looking back and forth from your painting to me, now going near and now stepping back from the easel. Still quite a lot to do, huh? Can't leave it like this. Where do you think it still needs more working over? Oh, it's very good. And the way you flew. We'll call it the birthday. Your heart had stopped pounding now. Will you come again tomorrow? I'll paint another picture and we'll fly away again. Painting a picture, building a whole world is the job of a design team on a production. And I'd like to share you, share with you uh, some reflections from our designers for Flying Lovers. Now, the production team from props master Pamela Miles to sound designer Jim Uphoff really benefited from this sumptuous source for visuals and words. Some of the members of the team were able to share their inspirations and plans at first rehearsal for Flying Lovers, and I'd like to offer you their perspectives as you prepare to enter the theater and experience the world that they've created. Sam Taylor. Our music director first is fascinated by the broad range of musical sources from which the original composer, Ian Ross, pulled. It's a mosaic of music that has all sorts of interesting inspirations that draws on a lot of genres, he said at first rehearsal. Mark Chagall once said, you have to make drawings sing with color. And this play seeks to create a dreamy texture spanning time and place of the story. Chagall has well-known work painted for opera halls, ballet, and more. Music played a very big role in his life, Sam shared, so it's really no surprise how the two forms speak to each other. Within the piece, listen for such variety. A Yiddish poem, the song Making Believe, which was nominated for an Academy Award in 1944, recorded by Ella Fitzgerald in the same year. Uh, side note, 1944 is a very significant year in the life of the Chagalls, if you don't know already why, you'll discover. Uh, another thing you'll hear is a theme pulled from a Tchaikovsky piano trio. You'll hear an original song by Ian Ross and much, much more. This mosaic translated also into our scenic design. At first rehearsal, scenic designer Chris Dunham shared how he and Brian thought very early on about the needs of the space. So first the playhouse and how to craft a space that they could um, use to stage the best audience experience of the play and the play itself. They both wanted an arena that both actors and musicians could really activate. For that reason, and for the sake of the intimacy of the story, the majority of the playing space is actually very small. There's a main platform, and you'll observe that supporting this sense of displacement and travel, the idea of a nomadic life is a host of suitcases surrounding it. Suitcases serve a twofold purpose. They're also a practical element to help get props on and off the stage and to hide surprises throughout. In a nod to that mosaic of music, Chris elected to find a backdrop to the set that had a mosaic quality, something he said that is also pieced in that way, but also very something, very much something that obviously references Chagall's work. The translucent piece you'll see pulls from the America windows at the Art Institute of Chicago. They'll also allow for a canvas for our lighting designers, Greg Hoffman's work. Shelly Cornier, our costume designer, said, uh, would like to say, she related at first rehearsal, that Mark Chagall designed the costumes. So she, like other designers on the team, was inspired both by Mark's words and by the paintings featured themselves. One quote from which she drew for inspiration is as follows. Only love interests me 
and I am only in contact with things that revolve around love. Actors may be reminiscent uh, as the characters, both of themselves, and of how they are or have been depicted in art. Mark, she said, will have a green jacket with paint splattered all over it, an element that she was very much looking forward to working on. Bella has a signature look, a dress that you may find familiar if you're familiar with Chagall's work. Another element to come in her look, you'll know it when you see it, will have writing, her own writing, on the piece itself. The musicians who are on stage with them will appear in clothes that could be reminiscent of Russian Jews or Russian soldiers. Before I mention our artists on the stage, I'd like to share that Shelley is actually making her Ford debut with Flying Lovers. So welcome, a hearty welcome, Shelley, to working with us. Now to the artists on stage. Bella and Mark are played by Emily Glick and Marcus Trujinsky. Emily returns to the forward stage after having played Rona in the production of The Amateurs a few years ago. Jen Gray thought about bringing in Emily very early on for this, in part because of the rapport that she and Brian already have, but it's also a boon. Uh, she said to be able to use a Madison-based actress who is Jewish, who is known to our audience, uh, and who is deeply loved. Marcus, also deeply loved, is back for his fifth production with Ford. He was most recently seen uh, as Facebender in last season's Airness. Joining Emily and Marcus on stage are Sam Taylor on piano, mandolin, and accordion, and Brian Grimm on cello. Brian's name you might remember because he designed sound for us more re most recently uh, for the Garbologists and last season um, for the Wanderers. But you'll see him making music here on stage for the first time. Sam is also making his debut on stage at Ford, though he is a well-known musician and music director with other Madison companies such as Children's Theatre of Madison and Four Seasons Theatre. Sam, of course, also serves as music director for the production, so the instrumentation and arrangement of voices in the piece have all been sculpted under his labor. I think that's where I'd like to leave you for today. Thank you for joining us for this introduction to a great 20th century love story. As you immerse yourself in the world of the Chagalls, however, I'd like to invite you to consider something. How our production team and all of the artists working up on the stage may offer up to you feeling beyond words. Taste, take in what you feel through color, light, object, and the shapes of bodies in space. So in other words, step aside, immersive Van Gogh. <laughs> what longings or memories, Ford patrons, come to you? Enjoy, and we'll see you inside the playhouse. Take care. Till next time. <laughs>